So let me introduce an, uh, our uh, another speakers, Jay. Uh, actually, Jay is uh, one of the global uh, API and tech investor, and then he will be talking about the business of APIs. And his section is uh, actually one of my most uh, anticipated uh, session today. So uh, we are getting other uh, section check people uh, joining this section as well. So Jay, uh, you can hear me as well? I can. Yeah, can yeah, okay. So, yeah, yeah. So can you try to share the screen and then, uh, yeah, okay. So you can try to make it full screen. Okay, good. So I will uh, pass the stage to you. Thanks, Jay. Great. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for, for taking the time to listen. I know it's uh, been the end of a long day, and uh, I'm really honored to, to be here to round up the, the session. So today, um, I'll be talking about the business of APIs, and this comes from my time building and running the world's largest API marketplace. Now. Um, when I look across the board, right, there are some quite interesting ways that enterprises have used APIs to, to drive their business. Some of the examples out there include companies like, like Salesforce and Twitter, where APIs were a way to turn their existing products into a platform by letting third parties build on top uh, complementary services. In the case of AWS, APIs were a way to move customers from infrastructure up to higher level services so you can um, capture uh, more share of wallet. EBA is an interesting use case where they use APIs to turn an existing um, platform into an ecosystem, right? By extending the core offering, which was um, auction products into, into other um, channels. And one example that I really like that isn't here is the company Best Buy which is a, a North American consumer electronics retailer uh, that's largely offline brick and mortar business. They actually use APIs as a digital enabler, right? To power things like loyalty programs for credit cards. So, so I really love that example. And if you look at the empirical data, there is a lot of value to be derived from API adoption. Uh, this study, the impact of APIs on firms' performance, uh, was a 2017 study that looked across 58 uh, enterprises. And what they found is that API adoption drove an average increase of 10.3% in the firm's value. Now, I just want to take a step back and, and introduce myself quickly, just to share some perspective of where I'm coming from. Uh, my work largely is, an, uh, is as a technology venture builder. In the last five years, I've launched two different tech businesses for two different companies. I spent the last three years building and running the world's largest API marketplace. I'm also an investor and advisor to tech and API startups, uh, including some exits under my belt. Uh, and I got an MBA from INSEAD. So how I got into all of this, it started about three years ago. Uh, I actually found myself on a flight across the Pacific Ocean I ended up in Silicon Valley. Uh, I met the CEO of a startup in a WeWork with five other employees. Out of that first meeting, that started, startup ended up raising venture funding from Andreessen Horowitz and Microsoft Ventures. Uh, the deal that we struck, a strategic partnership, ended up becoming a, an API marketplace. Our, our vision then really was to build like an app store for APIs, right? So we wanted a single platform for developers as users to be able to find APIs to access them easily, subscribe and manage them all on one, on one platform. And if I had to summarize our mission, it's this. It was for API providers, it was about helping them be successful by reaching our community of a million users around the world. And for developers, it was about simplifying the whole lifecycle process end to end from discovering APIs to testing and connecting to services to making payment and managing them. And the reason that I talk about this today is that I believe that, you know, I consider myself quite lucky to be in this unique position in that the way we make, uh, we, we generate and capture value out of the API ecosystem is basically transaction driven, right? We're a market maker. And what's good for us is, fundamentally good for all of us that, that are watching in this conference today, right? We have a vested interest in, in driving transactions and connectivity because this is what sustains all of us. So this is the perspective that I'll be speaking from. So let's jump into it. Now, the first point I wanna make is that 
API businesses are intrinsically more valuable than software or SaaS, right? Often you hear about SaaS being coveted for a recurring revenue streams. And I believe APIs are even more valuable than that. And here's why. The first reason is that APIs as a single product serve all digital interfaces. It's one product that you can serve web apps, uh, native mobile, SaaS, or even plugins. Which means that if you're an API provider, you only have this one version to maintain and, and a very large segment to address. The second point is around APIs being quick and easy to integrate. So developers today, if your documentation is well done, they will uh, they are already accustomed to self-service integration. And in fact, they probably prefer it over being uh, over speaking to a salesperson which means that if you're an API provider providing a service, it, it, it gives you shorter and more efficient sales cycles. The next point is that API business models are pay-as-you-go pricing, right? If a customer consumes one unit of something, you charge them for one unit. For users, it means that there is no getting around the, the cost effectiveness of using a publicly available API service if it fits your use case. Cost is absolutely not one of the reasons. If you're an API provider, it means that your revenue scales alongside your users' traffic. In that way, API services are platform products in and of themselves. And the last point is around stickiness or churn. Now, APIs are famously easy to integrate and they're actually quite easy to, to remove. But there's actually a high switching cost involved because their breakage risk of swapping out one API for another is actually quite high. And therefore, API services, they tend to be more sticky than SaaS. Now, these are the qualitative reasons. What does the market tell us? So to drive this point home, right? I think we should do an apples to apples comparison of SaaS companies and API companies in, in, the public sec in, in public markets. Now, on the SaaS side, I basically pick two, probably two of the hottest SaaS stocks out there in Atlassian and Zoom. What you're seeing here is that um, as of a recent snapshot, these companies in the public markets, their revenues were valued between 30 and 50 X. If you look at APIs, and I represent that with Adyen uh, and, and Twilio, their revenue multiples are actually between 70 and up to even ex exceeding 100. So I don't think that this is definitive by any means, but for me, it's quite a strong indicator of the argument that I'm making of API revenues being more valuable. Now, all this is like fascinating to me because um, when you look back at things, um, what we find is that APIs are actually a relatively new business model. So the graph that you're looking at is a Google Trends search index for the term SOAP API in red and REST API in blue. And the story this tells is that it was only about 10 years ago, towards the end of 2008, that REST API started to catch up with SOAP in popularity. And the reasons are, are actually quite interesting for me. There, there are twofold, right? One is that REST is more lightweight and responsive. It's more usable. The second thing is that uh, REST produces JSON output, which is more human readable and intuitive than XML. And I think there's an interesting point here about paying attention to what users want. Now, if we take this same data set and extrapolate it today, this is what you see. You know, for the first time, you know, since in the last 10 years or so, we now have a de facto standard uh, around protocols for APIs, and that is REST at this point. And roughly in the same period, we saw the rise of native API companies. These are pure play, pure play API companies who rely on APIs as a distribution technology. Of these logos on the left here, Stripe, Adyen, SendGrid, and Twilio, 14 years ago, none of these companies existed. Seven years ago, they hit a billion dollar valuation and that was big news. And now they're in the tens of billions. And despite all of this, I firmly believe that we are just at the starting gate of, of uh, API business models. It is true that probably in spaces like payment processing, communications and email, uh, the playing field and the leaders are, are largely set. 
But I think we're going to see plenty of new uh, sectors coming up. Some of them that I'm tracking are B2B or lead enrichment. Um, there are cases in of technologies like computer vision being applied to KYC. And of course, like search is a really important category because uh, every website pretty much needs it. And I think because of all of this success, the growth of APIs will continue. By some estimates today, there are over 30,000 public APIs. And um, if you look on programmable webs directory, they show about a 40% year on year growth in discount um, going for the last 10 years and it's not slowing down yet. I think if you are an API provider and your business model is predicated on this, you have a risk of being stuck in what I call a digital ocean. This pie chart that you're looking at is from Apigee State of the API report. The lesson, in, the message it sends is that 90% uh, 90 of API call traffic goes to the top 25% of APIs and vice versa. If we extrapolate that logic from Apigee's customer subset to the wider API ecosystem, the numbers probably look quite similar. And so it's quite paradoxical that APIs are purely digital products. They exist on the internet, they're theoretically fictionist, but if you don't nail your go-to-market down, you risk getting stuck in one of these orange slices. Now, for all of us to get better and to be more successful, I wanna talk about developer experience or what I'm gonna call DX. I think the developer experience needs to get a whole lot, lot better for us to be successful together. I spent the last two or three minutes talking about API proliferation and diversity. And, and while that's good because there is space to play for a lot of these players, this proliferation actually exacerbates the discovery problem. So this graph here, this infographic actually is produced by the API Days team. It's something that they maintain called the API landscape. And it gives us a small snapshot into the diversity that exists today. And look at this and think about a developer, put yourself in their shoes. They're looking for an API for a, public ser uh, for a particular service. They've got to sift through all of this to find, you know, three to five different service providers to choose from. And let's say they can get through all that and navigate it. They then need to go through each, uh, each developer portal individually. And each developer portal is set up differently um, and, and it's hard to process it all. It's necessarily a manual process today. I think you know, whoever can come up with a solution to programmatically at scale and across use cases solve API comparison, there's a big prize at the end of this. And so the discovery and the processing part of things is only the start of it. After that, our users struggle with access issues. Often they don't get um, approval. There's an approval-based access. So you've got to make an application and then wait to, to get permissions. Uh, pricing might not be clear. There might not be trial plans. So you have to actually spend before you can test out a service. Connecting often isn't much better because a lot of developer portals have very bad tooling. You might not have an API, a self-service subscription, and there's no way to tell if the API is reliable enough for your use or not. And finally, through your application lifecycle, you've got to manage all of these services. And basically, that means for every single API provider, you need to maintain one account. For every API service, you need to manage a separate key. For every provider, you need to make a payment every month. And one, and you've got a dashboard to check uh, each time. And all of these things, all of these frictions in the DEX basically makes APIs uh, incompatible with modern development practices like Agile, CICD, and DevOps. And, and we're behind, in my opinion. Now, what's interesting is that we're seeing some market reactions, I think, emerge to solve this complexity. The one that, that gets me really excited is this idea of APIs as aggregators. This is the uh, idea where a single API can, can aggregate multiple APIs of similar function into one so that developers can on, only need to access one point. Right, it's often used um, when it's especially useful when your customers 
uh, have a very deep vertical of, of service providers and are all using different systems or accounts. Some examples that exist uh, are Nylas, which is unifying mailboxes, CRMs, and schedulings into a single API. Zeus is aggregating different payment processors into, into one API and routing uh, payments to the most cost-effective method. And then Plaid uh, is, a, is an API that provides the plumbing to different consumer banks, right? They've basically built uh, integrations to all the retail banks so that if you're a fintech app, you can transact uh, through the Plaid API irrespective of what account your users have. And this plumbing is extremely valuable. In Q1, Plaid was acquired by Visa to the tune of $5 billion. I'm going to shift gears a little bit now and talk about enterprise API adoption. For most of you out there, you know, there are very few pure play native API companies. So more than likely, if you're listening to this, um, you're an enterprise. Very often, we see that the enterprise API journey looks like this. The very first phase is starting with internal APIs. This is the middle, middleware view of the world, right? Where APIs are used for operational efficiency. They become a mechanism for sharing data um, or different services. Then the enterprise tends to, to migrate to consuming public APIs. And this is about external, leveraging external capabilities or specific uh, specializations that you don't have in-house and it's not cost efficient to build and maintain. And after that, um, the enterprise might even become an API publisher on their own. Uh, they their goals there would be to generate external API usage in order to monetize or build an ecosystem around their services. Now, we spoke to a lot of these enterprises, and here's what we learned. We learned that for every enterprise that is using internal APIs, two-thirds are already using public APIs, and one-third are externalizing them. We also asked these companies what their top pain points were, and this is what they said. Their top five pain points had to do with API performance, so the reliability. Second, it had to do with security. Third was documentation quality. Fourth, API discovery. And the fifth one would be capability of, of um, internal developers. I think what's interesting for me is that if I map these pain points according to the three phases, of maturity, we see that actually 10 out of the 12 things on this list have to do with consuming public APIs, which suggests that a lot of enterprises get stuck in that middle uh, tier and they, they might struggle to break out into becoming an API publisher. So that's what I want to address next. So I think for enterprises to uh, break out and, and to become full-fledged API companies, right? They've got to adopt what I call APIs of product thinking. I use the term as a product because, you know, it necessitates that commercial and technical people come together. The technical side of this graph on the left about designing APIs, about what best practices should be, about security, this is a well-trodden path. And, and there are a lot of experts that can help you out with that. What's actually... I think more of a, a blue sky and white space is what's on the right of this graph, of this chart. You know, on the business side, you need to do things like having a pricing framework and competitor analysis so you can price your services to the best value without leaving money on the table. You've got to figure out how to set the right channels and access both your own and on third-party platforms. And you've got to nail marketing both offline and online. So the way I think about a fully-fledged API program is actually in a series of layers. We talked about the bottom layer, the functional layer, which is all the things that you need to do. The middle layer is the operational layer, which is do you have the right team in place to do the things that, that need to get done? And then the top layer is the executive layer. In a large organization especially, having an executive is key to making sure that the initiative has the right sponsorship and the right support, and it doesn't remain purely an IT concern. So I'm going to take another uh, deep dive into the marketing side of things because that's the most common area that, that I think um, where enterprises or, or companies have gaps in. I'm going to start with this idea of, um, of brand identity. 
Now, if you're an existing enterprise, you need to think about how your brand identity impacts your audience uh, and how what kind of traffic that drives to your site. To illustrate this point, you know, I'm benchmarking here uh, different, different website domains and looking at API keywords. So this is the idea, okay, uh, something API, and is it associated with a particular domain? We see that for native API players, only about 0.8% of their organic keywords have the word API in them. For established enterprise API programs, it's maybe half a percent. So I show this to make two points, right? Number one, you need to pay attention to your online footprint and SEO. Second, think about these numbers as benchmarks to hit. You know, what organic keywords is your dev portal rating for? You know, and how does it compare to this? On the marketing side, what you're looking at here is all the individual activities that me and my team have carried out over the years, both offline in DevRel and digital. And it's a lot of stuff. And I'll be the first one to admit that I made a lot of mistakes. So I'm going to share a few lessons here and hopefully it's of value to you and, and you can go about setting up your program a bit better. The first one is don't reinvent the wheel. Go look, go think about where your uh, audience resides. So you don't have to build everything from scratch. So one example where we did this successfully is using Quora. Quora is great for a few reasons, right? Um, firstly, it's the format. Quora is basically crowdsource questions uh, and, and contributors can, can put up uh, answers. It's relatively short form, so it doesn't require a whole lot of effort. And as you answer more specific questions, uh, the algorithm kicks in and starts pushing things for you. So you don't actually have to go look for questions, right? It's just served up to you. Using this approach and using a persona account, and by the way, those screens are actual responses that I wrote myself. We were able to generate growing passive traffic um, on the bottom graph. You see that passive traffic growing, and these users were converting into registrations at about a 7% rate organically. Another thing that we did was to, to do content marketing using our blog. One thing that we implemented was to use repeatable standardized frameworks for content. The idea really was quite simple. If you can standardize blog content, I can operationalize and make it more efficient. It also means that I can outsource it so that I can pay somebody to do it and, and focus my team on uh, more higher value tasks. And using this format, we were able to churn out multiple articles a week on our blog. And you see in the blue box there how we were able to grow traffic over time. And on the, the bottom half of the blue box, how our registration rate uh, increase and stabilize over time. And finally, using this same content, we republished it on uh, other platforms like Medium. And in a six months period from December 2019 to May 2020, we grew organic views on from Medium from 4,000 to almost 10,000 a month. So the last thing I'll leave you with is uh, my marketing stack. So think of this as a framework to plan out your, your API marketing uh, activities, right? On the left are the uh, activities that you do. In the middle are the tools that, that we uh, run and how we string them together. And on the right are objectives. Um, feel free to use it. I encourage you to, to play with this framework. Don't treat it as a recipe uh, that you follow verbatim, but you know it's more like a, a guideline that, that can help shape your efforts. And that's my time for today. I appreciate all of you listening. If any of you want to connect with me, um, this is my info on LinkedIn, AngelList, Twitter, or even my email. Thank you, everyone. Oh, thanks, Jay. Uh, so I, we, we got one question that maybe we want to quickly ask you. So uh, this uh, one question talking about, apart from maybe video, uh, API like Zoom, what do you think some major payout or API trend that is uh, beneficial uh, under the pandemic? situations. Can, uh, do you have uh, any insights on this one? Yeah. Um, so I think the question was around, you know, what, what are the sectors that are going to be hot, you know, in, in COVID, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if I have an answer specifically for, um, you know, the COVID scenario. Um, I think one of the things that one of the sectors I'm really hot on is the idea of like B2B data, mm. right? Um, one of my slides I showed, um, 
uh, in, in the lead generation space is um, a company called Clearbit. I think Clearbit last year raised a crazy Series B. You know, they raised $15 million on $250 million valuation, right? It proves that there's a lot of value in that space. Now, a lot of this stuff, it only exists in the U.S., right? Mm. Um, but there's definitely a case to be made for, for the rest of the world. If somebody can, you know, unify and structure and gather these data sources and, and to be able to serve up, you know, B2B leads um, mm. in a programmatic way using an API. Yeah, got, 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 got your points. So, yeah, I think uh, that's also the time uh, uh, to wrap up as well. So thanks, thanks again, Jay, for your time. And then uh, I think the cow from the Hong Kong should, should be learned a lot from you. So thanks again for your time. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jay. Bye-bye.